I'm Pamela Pumpkin, and this is Alan. Just Hi, my name is Alan Richardman. <laughs> this is my partner Mason, and I found out that you're not white. Yep, that's me. I'm a I'm I'm a master's degree in opera, and I'm not white. <laughs> When we were doing research, we realized that there are literally anti-Semites who think Jewish people like Mason here, not Mel Allen, Mason, um, are not white. Look at that. Look at that face. Yeah. So I guess I am in the entertainment industry, so that does kind of fit the stereotype, doesn't it? Oh my it? gosh. Woo! I uh, did a lot of research on this. Um, okay, there are a lot of academics that go into the question, why anti-Semitism? When you look, look at that face. How could you be anti-Semitic? Um, I'm reading, sorry. It's very useful to, <laughs> to understand, and I highly recommend looking into it. There's a lot of history involved. But I just have a few minutes, and I kind of want to talk about how we can be useful against the fight anti-semitism when it's still a lot I have to say um, okay first it's important to say that it's crazy just it's a crazy but crazy has its own sort of sanity so for example if you told me my son was not my son I wouldn't believe you okay I would be like no he's my son I'll say I went home and to find photos of my son to prove that he was my son and they weren't there and I couldn't find my his birth certificate I wouldn't think oh I must be wrong about my son I would think someone took it okay and then if doctors came in and lawyers came in and psych eval evaluators came in and said you don't have a son I would start thinking that you guys were all in on it and my family was in on it and my friends were in on it and then if it just kept going, it would expand to the government. And then when information challenged that belief that it wasn't the government, I wouldn't think, oh, I guess I was wrong about my son. I would start thinking lizard people, aliens, because what isn't going to happen is that I don't believe in that my son is my son. And that's an important thing to remember about paranoia and conspiracy. It just takes one one. So to end up conspiratorial or crazy, you just need one break with reality. So imagine if you were brought up to believe in white supremacy or in that men know better than women or that Christians are better than other people. And you go out into the world and that belief is challenged. So that's going to happen to all of us. You go through your go into life and your belief is challenged and what happened to me, I, it was hard. When I uh, lost my faith, it was hard. I went through this period of confusion and depression when I tried to figure out what I believed. And it was a very uncomfortable time. Um, I lost my sense of morality and I still wanted to be a good person, but I didn't know what that meant. So I had to rebuild my paradigm. Um, and that happened, thankfully, before the age of 25, 24, 24. Um, 24 is really when our brains are finished developing. So if you don't go through that experience before the age of 24, you're going to have a hard time doing it when reality confronts you in, later on in life. And a lot of people don't even bother with it. A lot of people, when faced with confirmation bias, um, well, they experience cognitive dissonance is really what they experience. And then they go to what they were taught. A lot of them don't challenge their own beliefs. Instead of thinking, well, maybe I'm wrong about what I believe. They think, I'm not wrong. There's some other reason. By the way, I believe this is part of the reason there's a conservative agenda against higher education. Because in college, you're taught how to think critically and if they can get people to not learn how to think critically over the age of 25 they're gonna more likely engage in conspiratorial thinking anyway so how do you rationalize um your biases if reality is confronting them well that's where this the stereotype of the jew comes in Trigger warning, 
I'm gonna talk about anti-Semitism using that stereotype. I don't believe that. Trigger warning. I'm gonna talk about a lot of anti-Semitic bullshit. Content warning, trigger warning. Have you been trigger warned? I have been triggered. Wait, no, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, he's never heard any of this before, so this is the first time he's hearing any of it, right? We up. Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay. How do you explain the failures of capitalism if you can't confront, if you can't deal with the fact that your parents or your ideology was wrong about capitalism? What are you going to do? Well, the stereotypical Jew is that of a mid-level tradesman the broker, the agent, the lawyer, the banker. Kind of the boots on the ground capitalist, or more like an agent for capitalists, the person who works, you know, in a professional setting to deal with capital. And by the way, this stereotype has resisted, persisted prior to capitalism as an economic system. It was there before to protect the truly wealthy from the proletariat. So let's say you experience a recession and this recession is the fault of greedy Wall Street bad actors. What's gonna happen? You get, you you fall behind in your mortgage and so who calls you? A banker, a lawyer, a broker. Um, so your initial angry response at the, the unjustness of it will not be projected onto the actual capitalist pulling all the strings, but on the person you are dealing with, which is, even if they're not Jewish, the stereotype is kind of a bucket to put your resentment. So you, you start projecting your resentment on the people who are actually calling you, trying to collect their mortgage payment. Okay? Am I explaining this? Okay. Yeah, it's just like a proximity effect thing where you put your emotions on the closest available person, essentially. Yeah, exactly. Now, there are historical reasons for this, um, and it has a lot to do with um, a Christian belief in not lending money, but Jewish people didn't hold that. And I don't like talking about this that much because it just kind of like almost justifies it. But there, there is history to all that, but practically speaking, um, the anti-Semite the anti-Semic has an idea of, they, they have separated Jewish actors from the failures of capitalism. Okay, so what are you gonna do if you've been taught that white supremacy- I'm here, ready to answer your questions and tell jokes about cats. So anyways, what are you gonna do if you've been taught that white people are better and you're confronted with black excellence? What are you gonna do? Well, instead of thinking, oh, well, maybe I was wrong, because again, if you are going to end up in a, an, an anti-Semite, you probably aren't going to confront your confirmation biases and you're probably not gonna engage in critical thought. So instead, you're gonna think there's something else going on. Now, we were kind of talking about this a little bit earlier, but, um, the anti-Semite tends to think as the Jewish person as like kind of white. Um, so they're still white in that they're intelligent and cunning and ambitious, but they're not white in that they're one of a person of, you know, white supremacy. It's kind of an icky feeling, isn't it? Like that your whiteness can be revoked because then you're just like, how do you feel about that? Uh, not great, though. No. Uh, it certainly points out the fact that uh, inherent personhood can be pretty clearly recognized as being tied to whiteness in the first place. Now look at that uh, insight. <laughs> I think it's interesting because like, the fact that your whiteness can be revoked is totally admitting, like you said, it's also admitting that um, the white hegemony totally exists. So the anti-Semite, when confronted with black excellence, will think there's another person pulling the strings. They can't think, 
black people are actually excellent so that they think there's a Jewish person acting as a puppet master. I know this sounds wild, but it's literally what Kanye West said to P. Diddy. I'm not the one who says this, they say it. If you go to a thread with Lizzo, like right now, you will see people in the thread saying things like, um, she's being controlled by an agenda. Um, they'll even sound like kind of nice to her. They're just like, oh, she's so talented, but doesn't she know she's being controlled by an agenda? I'm really not making this up. I just listened to that. Anti-Semitism plays a real large outsized role in supporting the Christian hegemony. <sighs> I know this sounds nuts, but it's real. I used to believe this. I used to be in the Christian right. Uh, anyways, the Christian right believes that um, the state of Israel was prophesied um, in the Bible, that Israel belongs to the Jews, promised by God. And um, so, you know, fuck the Palestinians, I guess. That um, there will be a war and that war will either compel the Jews to convert to Christianity or it will kill them. If you've ever wondered if there was more going on with um, the evangelical opposition to Obama's peace accord with Iran, there was. They actually believe that was anti-biblical. So Donald Trump scuttling that was actually what they wanted. The Christian right is a doomsday cult. So as I was writing this and Mason was helping me and looking it over, um, this was actually kind of news to him. And um, yeah, that, that was news to me. I did, had no idea he didn't know this. Uh, yeah, I'd always just thought about the, the right support of Israel as a modern political expediency thing. Um, and I still think that's true for the, the the leaders of the right, but for the larger population of evangelicals, it, it makes sense that, to have a, just a simpler reason for them to follow and doesn't get a lot simpler than because the Bible said so. He just said it a lot better than I said it. What I wrote was whether Zionism is sincerely held belief or so Inflammation of oil dependency, an allied Israel strategic asset in the Western control of Middle Eastern oil, but I think he said it a lot better than I did. You see a common theme here of um, anti-Semitism acting as a buffer. Um, you have capitalists using anti-Semitism to shield from criticism. You have racists using anti-Semitism to shield their ego and their and the structure of white supremacy. You have um, anti-Semitism serving the Christian hegemic order and politics. But you, even though we can draw a direct line through these three things, you will notice that the paranoia sets in in all um, efforts towards equality. I. Feminism, they'll, they'll accuse a feminist of being paid by George Soros. Um, gay rights, George Soros, uh, agenda. Uh, trans rights, agenda. It's this all this agenda to tear down the white Christian male American hegemony. It's this sense of the Jewish person, the Jewish actor, the Jewish agenda as kind of like a second son or um, and also ran to power. Um, they they think that because because the Jewish so short so close sorry so close to being in the dominant position that they must therefore be acting to reach the dominant position. And it's a projection. It's they project it because that's what they would do. Just go check the comments of anything that is talking about a move towards equality and you will see this. I'm not making this up. Neo-Nazis hate miscegenation. I am a mother 
of a mixed race child. For a while, I really felt like I had to, to be a good mom, understand this. And so I actually jumped on 4chan and I talked to neo-Nazis a lot and they were more than willing to talk to me. They portrayed this idea as kind of like not really hateful, but as game recognizes game. I had one neo-Nazi told me if he was Jewish, he would act with, he would do the same thing and try to tear down the order of things. You see a common theme here of um, anti-Semitism acting as a buffer. Um, you have capitalists using anti-Semitism to shield from criticism. You have racists using anti-Semitism to shield their ego and their and the structure of white supremacy. You have um, anti-Semitism serving the Christian hegemonic order and politics. But you, even though we can draw a direct line through these three things, you will notice that the paranoia sets in in all um, efforts towards equality. I, feminism, they'll, they'll accuse the feminists of being paid by George Soros. Um, gay rights, George Soros, uh, agenda, uh, trans rights, agenda. It's this, all this agenda to tear down the white Christian male American hegemony. It's this sense of the Jewish person, the Jewish actor, the Jewish agenda as kind of like a second son or um, and also ran to power. Um, they they think that because because the Jew is so short, so close, sorry, so close to being in the dominant position that they must therefore be acting to reach the dominant position. And it's a projection. It's they project it because that's what they would do. Just go check the comments of anything that is talking about a move towards equality and you will see this. I'm not making this up. Neo-Nazis hate miscegenation. I am a mother of a mixed race. When you really sit with this, you start to realize why anti-Semitism has this like secular, sickly, secular, sickly cycle. Sickly, secular. Six cycle, the six cycle. It's the six cycle of anti-Semitism, because any any march towards equality is going to trigger their paranoia. The hegemony cannot square with equality. <laughs> it's heavy, right? Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think it it comes down to that like bias protection that um, Lydia was talking about, rather than. Um, engage with arguments for equality because I think they, they recognize that or most people recognize that movement towards equality is like the morally sensible thing to do but because they're comfortable with the way things are and they recognize that movement towards equality is going to cause the way things are to change um, the bias protection comes in and they start to hyperbolize um, the, the, the arguments for equality and turn them into attacks on, on, uh, their way of life instead. Sometimes, sometimes I feel like you and I will like flip flop in how much we judge <laughs> bigotry. <laughs> like I judge bigotry as usually as far more stupid than you do. But I think like this time, I think we actually switched and um, you're judging, judging it as far more stupid than I am. I'm not sure actually, but. It, it's almost like I get impressed with how powerful human self delusion can be sometimes. Yeah, that's true. So what's the answer? Well, <laughs> so you're talking about this earlier, but I find it. I was actually quite co uncomfortable talking about this because um, it's hard to talk about and the Jewish question, it just, by saying that, it, it feels like I'm going to either talk out of my lane or talk 
um, or dabble in anti-Semitism myself. Um, and <laughs> a lot of times it's important to understand that you may not know what the right thing to do is, but you can still recognize a problem. It is okay to be a critic without a solution. And so what uh, can be done? Here we go. I'm gonna solve my solve anti-Semitism so if you don't. Alright, let's go. Okay. <laughs> I'll be watching and and judging. No, okay. And what if I fail? I'm going to fail. It's, it's okay. So is everyone else. <laughs> okay. Um in my mind, what we have to do is threefold. The first one is direct activism. When you see explicit anti-Semitism, you have to fight it. You absolutely have to, have to fight it. Fascism, neo-Nazis, they're out there, they're real, and they have to be fought. The second thing is proclaiming equality as a value. We need to have um, white people identify their core sense of self with anti-racism. We have to have men derive self-satisfaction from being a feminist. We have to have Christians believe in freedom of religion. We have to have straight people want to be gay allies. And what is hard about this is there's such a concerted, concerted effort right now to um, criticize, you know, virtue signaling. And I'm saying you have to signal your virtues. You have to go out there and speak the good fight. You have to say these things. You have to say these things as a matter of culture and narrative. It's funny because like, I'm literally talking about an agenda, aren't I? <laughs> uh, yeah, in the end, um, everyone has a, a, an agenda, like history is a narrative, society is a narrative. That's what people talk about when they talk about the zeitgeist is the, the narrative of society. And um, so if... So what, we do have an agenda. If you wanna make society better, you have an agenda to to make like specific those specific changes. <sighs> so they're right. <laughs> we also have to promote education. And of course that goes right into what I was just talking about, especially like, you know, with Florida and Texas and they're rallying against um, teaching reality. Don't be afraid of agenda. Um, there is a concerted agenda right now to believe a lie. And if we know, if, if everything we're saying, if this premise of these videos, these many videos is true, to get people to believe in a conspiracy, they just have to believe one lie. So we have to fight that. We have to proactively fight that and not just be on the defensive. Donald Trump was not denied the election. And that, you know, kind of brings into play, I think. No, I'm, I'm sure the link, why anti-Semitism is, is always linked with fascism. Uh, yeah, I, I think um, fascism and, and anti-Semitism have the same roots because they're, uh, they, they grow easily in, um, conservatism and anti-intellectualism, uh, because those groups are, are more vulnerable to confirmation bias and, um, people looking to, to leverage large groups for fascistic purposes are, are going to aim for those types of people because in the end, yeah, they just need to get enough people to believe in that, that one big lie. And once they have that, then they can manipulate 
um, their followers uh, to whatever, pretty much whatever extremes they want. And that's how you get fascist movements. Absolutely. And I think it also should be said that, um, you know, fascism really is a belief in classism, a belief that there should be a societal order that is un unequal. And so who, if this is, if, if they're, if you follow their thinking, um, who wants to change the social order, which is currently unequal, well, that would be the Jew. And that is why they just go head in hand. And, and you'll see this in completely comp different competing ide ideologies. A lot of um, Islamofascism is, is anti-Semitic, as well as Christian fascism, even though that they're like completely opposed to each other as well. It's wild. Okay, so epilogue time. I don't actually like citing my sources, not because I don't believe in that. I write, I write reports. Um, you know, that actually I cite my sources and read the reports I write. Um, but when you're talking about an online debate, I don't like doing that because bad faith actors will use an ad hominem attack against sources. See, it's happening right now. Listen to this little ad hominem attack. No, you can't go outside. So when I must cite my sources online, typically what I do is I just Google the question and then share the results of the Google search. And so let them pick the sources. That way they can't go, oh, well, you know, Vox is a liberal rag or something like that. So if you want me to, if you want to know my sources, just go to Google and type why anti-Semitism or what is anti-Semitism? Christianity and Zionism. What the heck is going on with Kanye? Anti-blackness and anti-Semitism. Semitism, anti-Semitism, and capitalism. Just, just take a look. What? What is it? He wants to go fight the good fight right now. Yeah. No, you're an indoor kitty. If anything I have said to you today um, is causing confirmation bias or cognitive dissonance. So confirmation bias is, you know, believing what you want to believe and cognitive dissonance is disbelieving what you don't want to believe. Sit with your discomfort. I encourage you, I challenge you to sit with your discomfort. Most people don't want to be bad people. And if that's you, <laughs> then just sit with your discomfort. Um, you can either pretend badness isn't bad, or you can actually just go be good. <laughs> so sit with it get through the discomfort and then go research it go look take your beliefs and shake them out look at both sides um your beliefs that can withstand critical thought and scrutiny are worth holding but if your beliefs are so fragile that they cannot withstand this process you shouldn't have them in the first place there are people of the christian faith who are not zionists there are people strong American patriots who would never assume a George Soros agenda. There are Republicans who speak plainly against the fascism and anti-Semitism and paranoia of Donald Trump. There are conservative educators who actually want to speak the truth of American history. Okay, so epilogue. 